talking about here? Nope, not yet. Not yet. We're going to do a quick shot. Yeah, everybody here. Ron, do not sit down. I'm not going to be in your shot, so you guys come on out here. <coughs> All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Denise Donlin. I'm going to moderate for you today. And uh, just so everybody knows how it goes, because you've never been to a press conference before, obviously, no. I'm going to do about 20 minutes and uh, chat with our esteemed guests here. And then I'm going to throw it open to the audience, and I will help moderate that. As you know, there are microphones. And uh, we're going to try and end, well, we will end, at about 4.45, uh, because we have uh, something special going to happen. So, as you know, um, and also you need to go where you're going to be able to craft your rave reviews, right, on the press conference and the film. Once we're Brothers is, of course, opening for the uh, Toronto International Film Festival, and it's the first time a Canadian documentary has had a world premiere on opening night. So congrats to everybody involved. It sounds like a streetcar slash subway to me. Or it's the roar from another theater. <laughs> I'm not really sure. OK, so let me do a quick introduction. First, the director of Once Were Brothers, Toronto's own Daniel Rohr, sitting over there. <laughs> Beside Daniel, the co-founders of the legendary Imagine Entertainment, the incredible Ron Howard and Brian Grazer. Yeah. It's a, such an honor to have you here. Thanks for coming up. And uh, they, along with Martin Scorsese, of course, are the film's executive producers. And finally, Toronto's very own treasured musical icon, the great Robbie Robertson. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Robbie Robertson. OK, so I'm going to start with you, Daniel. Um, now, Everybody, most people at TIFF know you because you've been often celebrated for your short film work on uh, films like uh, The Survivor's Row about the uh, Batwa tribe in Uganda. <laughs> it's a very wide range, I found. Conversations with the dead prime minister, where... All we, the classics. That's right. You talk about uh, Prime Minister Mackenzie King and his penchant for talking to dead people, which is, you know, given the world leaders on the world stage today, it doesn't sound so weird now. And, of course, Sour Toe, the story of the story cannibal, uh, a toe my own lips have touched, by the way. So, despite the Globe calling you this morning untrained, I have to say I winced on that on your behalf, uh, there is a moment in anyone's creative life where you are called to make a big step. And this is your first feature film. So, I'd like to ask you if there was any new creative muscles you were flexing in this film, and... Of course, given the legendary stature of your partners on the film, any pressure? Well, um, it's an excellent question. <laughs> and uh, you know what was really unique about this project specifically is that it was a very archive-heavy documentary. Most of the film exists in the past. And so something that I didn't have a ton of experience with before is really delving into archives and uh, searching through you know, storage lockers on the Upper West Side of New York and Woodstock or in LA to find rare negatives or reels of film or, or any sort of ephemera <coughs> uh, that we could use in the documentary. And, and uh, that was a, a really, really interesting experience for me because it's almost like you're an archeologist going to uncover your film as opposed to inventing it in the edit suite or something like this. So uh, that was a, a, a lot of fun. And in terms of the pressure, you know, it's really amazing. I, I have this like legendary 
team surrounding me, these two gentlemen, or these three gentlemen, and I really only felt empowered. It was only exciting and empowering to be working with, with these people, and it was very much validating my own in instincts in a lot of ways, and, and everything that Imagine brought to the table um, you know, just took my creative instincts and put it on a rocket ship, um, and uh, I guess went to the moon in this case, yeah. which is appropriate. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, it shows in the film. I really, really enjoy watching it. Robbie, making a documentary like this is, uh, I imagine, a, a pretty intimate undertaking, and you will likely want a lot of trust with the people that you're working with. Why choose Daniel? How did this combination come about? Meh. <laughs> I, I, there, is, there is something that that we go on, on, on our journeys and everything, and it's called a gut feeling. In so many cases, in so many creative endeavors, that you think, I know this is taking a shot, it's taking a risk maybe, um, but something tells you, go forward. And and you you feel something, it's, it's quite mysterious in a way of, you know, what, what trust you can have. But besides seeing Daniel's work and everything, and when I met him, I thought, I recognize something here. I recognize other people that I've met over the years that had that certain spark, that certain something, and I thought, mm-hmm, I'm feeling this. And then there was a certain point that it struck me, because I said to him, you know, when we first met, I said, w w w by the way, uh, how old are you? <laughs> you know, and he said, 24? <laughs> and I said, what? He said, no, uh, so anyway, I thought, my God, I was 24 when I made music from Big Pink with the band and it just rang a bell, mm. and it said, okay, let's give it a shot. Right, oh, you recognize something in yourself and Daniel, that, that's amazing. Well done for taking that creative leap. Good job. Well, well let's talk about um, musical docs and films for a minute, and I, and I wanna ask this question of you, Ron and, and Brian, and you know, I mean, your legacy of success is immense. You know, creatively, you've been well rewarded with, you know, mountains of, uh, hardware, Oscars and Emmys and Globes, et cetera, but also commercially, where amazing films like Apollo 13 and, and Cocoon and, well, so many more, even, can't even begin to mention, have brought I'll bajillions, <laughs> bajillions to the, a beautiful mind, that's the one I was forgetting. But in germane to this film, I think, and perhaps less well known, are all the work you've done on musical films and with musicians. So uh, people from, you know, Pavarotti and Eminem and Eight Mile and, um, and the Beatles doc, uh, Eight Days a Week, et cetera, as well as the series that are, that are very heavily musical, uh, musically influenced like Empire and, and what was the one that debuted last night? Wu-Tang, an American Wu -Tang. saga? That's it. Yes, it. so debuted last night on Hulu. So the question is, what brought you to this musical documentary? And why, because I just love your cut line for Imagine so much, why is Robbie and the band's story a story that matters? Well, it's, it's a, to me, and, and we come at this differently, and it's kind of like the story of our whole partnership and, oh, microphone, microphone. Uh, it's a small enough room, I think you can hear me. Anyway, uh, it's kind of the story of our partnership, and we, we come at things very differently often, and yet, when we arrive at the same conclusion that this is a story worth telling, and here's perhaps how we ought to tell it, uh, it's we've had a, we've had a great success with it and had a lot of fun um, doing it. Now, Brian should you know talk about his relationship to music, and and um, I was never one of those kids that had music going all the time. I was not one of those people. I, I wasn't in my household, but. I obviously under, understood the power of, of, of music and what it could mean to, to movies, to television shows, and things like that. As I've started to move in, especially into the documentary world as a director, and in this case as a producer, here's what's amazing. The, you, you have these powerful stories, and yet there's this other element. Not only 
could you never possibly afford to have a soundtrack in a motion picture you would direct like we have uh, in Once We're Brothers? Uh, it's incredible. So it's a great experience for audiences. But you have the story of human beings and you have their voices in this other m mode, this other medium that's, that's equally powerful and works on this kind of amazing subliminal level. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, films that combine you know, a great narrative story, a rich set of characters with, this inc with incredible music, it's just so, uh, you know, it's captivating mm -hmm. for audiences, and so therefore it's also you know, really exciting for, for filmmakers. Right, and, and I'm gonna come back to that a little bit later because I'd really like to sort of dig into how it is when you build a documentary and work on a documentary with living people versus, you know, more creative license that perhaps you could have uh, with others. But first, Brian, why don't you talk about your, uh, your involvement with music and your, your love for using music in films and docs? Yeah, well, um, I love music. I mean, Ron, Ron, and Ron and I are funny because we do access on very, very important parts like theme and, and trust, and, uh, but uh, we do experience life almost entirely differently. Like, it's almost, we start here and it kind of goes like that. So, um, so in the case of music, I was always listening to music. I was I mean, music. I'm avidly uh, listening to music, and probably the first thing I well, our first movie, Night Shift, had tons of hit songs. Um, Boomerang had multiple platinum al albums. Um, I produced The Doors, and I just had this thing about Jim Morrison when I was going to high school, and uh, so. I, I'm very oriented, including you know, to music, but what I really get excited about, um, probably in the case of Eight Mile will, will sort of trigger that, is um, somebody said to me, actually, um, I'd met ODB, Old Dirty Bastard, and so the, the editor of the New York Times said, I think that's an inferior subculture. I thought to myself, <laughs> I don't think that's right. I think that hip hop, is going to be the culture. And so what interested me about that as it relates to Robbie as, as well is that the, it was the beginning of a movement and we can actually proof this out almost like a cinematic equation, which is exactly what you do, by the way, in documentaries. Um, so you have, if I have a thesis, then you try to prove it out cinematically. Uh, and movies, similarly, it's just slightly, it sort of comes to it from a different perspective, but you are doing the same exact thing. So I, I thought that Robbie, I mean, for sure, Robbie and the band is the quintessential survival story for a, the, for a rock band. I mean, it is the quintessential story. It's called the band <laughs> for a reason. And um, it's just so classic to me that he and the band were the progenitor, of, they were progenitors of a movement. And so that really excited me on that sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, in that level, the music level. But our, um, Robbie has been a personal friend and someone I've known for a very long time, probably 20 years I've known either Robbie or I've known of Robbie. He's always been a legend, all the time, with all the people that are in it, like David Geffen and all those people that are supporting uh, you know Robbie's importance in the in the world of music, but it was always every time you have a conversation with Robbie, he has something incredibly interesting to say, um, incredibly unique stories that help inform not only what the band itself, but its relationship to music itself. And um, he, he's just a legendary person, and we would say, let's find a way to work together. And it, when Robbie says that, it happens. Right, right. <laughs> and this is kind of evidence of that. <laughs> and I, I know that Ron and I, and Marty's not here at the moment, but we're all gigantically proud of being able to be associated with Robbie and, and this movie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. Well, it's a lot to be proud of. It really is, is quite wonderful. As a fan of the band myself, and also, uh, just watching the way you knit together this narrative through it. I want to pick up on the word you just mentioned earlier, because survival, because one thing that happens in the film is we go in, we get added extra layers of the last waltz, things we don't know from, just from watching the film or even from reading uh, Robbie's book, Testimony. There's extra layers in there. And the film is, 
is emotional in a lot of ways because it digs deep into the idea of how you survive in a creative industry, particularly with the band. There's a lot of recklessness going on. There's heroin addiction. There's uh, car wrecks. There's alcoholism and, and all the rest of that. So you survived, though, Robbie. You're the survivor. Um, and in the film, others comment on why that's the case. Your commitment to craft, you no know, addictive gene. How would you s describe your own survival skills? You know, it's, it's funny that in that program of people surviving with addiction, you know, there's a phrase in there that's so key. It's called one day at a time. Mm -hmm. And I just have very, very much thought of, I'm going to get up today and I'm going to follow that dream and I'm going to accept these challenges and move forward move forward was the thing. And when I saw the effects, you know, it, you know, some years ago, we, we really didn't understand alcoholism and addiction. Like it's come, you know, it's become much more clear what that really is. <coughs> Nobody referred to it back then the way they do to now. now. So t today, Today, when I look back on it, I feel very sad that we didn't have the tools to be able to help one another in this group. <clears throat> we probably did everything that you're not supposed to do. Why, if you do that again, mm -hmm. I'm gonna, you know, all that kind of stuff. There, was, there, there wasn't a support system. And so, you know, I, I carry a bit of sadness about that because I've lost, you know, three of my brothers in this group, and and it just, uh, although I am mo motoring on, I am accepting the new challenges, and I've got so many things that I want to discover and 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 get to in my work. Still, whenever I go to that place in my heart where I think I lost these guys, and and. There was, and I was helpless in it, and mm -hmm. it, that was a, it was a devastating feeling too. Yeah, I imagine, and the, and you know, just on the survival theme too, because the band they were all amazing survivors, uh, especially at the beginning, even backing up Dylan on that tour when you were getting stuff thrown at you and booed Talk constantly. about survival. Talk about survival. You're in a musical revolution. Yeah. I heard you actually altered a guitar strap so that you could use it as a weapon if people <laughs> jumped on the stage. But this, this is um, an editing question, really, and, and I'm throwing this to you, Daniel, because you know, when you look at the archival footage that is in that film, it's amazing. And there's, at one point, I think you and Dylan are in a bus, and you just come off stage, and the fans, and Dylan's saying, don't pull my fingers, and why did you even come to the show? And then, and then he looks at the camera, and he says, okay, let's get that turned off. I bet you tonight at the gala, there won't be a single person in the audience that goes, no, don't turn it off, and then it go, it's, it's off, right? So given all the footage, I imagine it was a challenge to keep it to under two hours. Were there, there are tough choices, things that, that you, you didn't want to make, but you had to at the end of the day to make it uh, actually pace itself as a good narrative? Well, it's, it's really interesting that you asked that because my approach is always, you know, keep it like 90 minutes is a sweet spot, huh? but there was just so much story to tell. The emotionality and the depth and breadth of this film demanded more time, um, but editorially, um, from an editorial standpoint, I had a pretty clear sense of, of what I wanted the film to look like. I wanted to have a, sort of the kinetic energy um, that, that Robbie's life had, the memoir reads like cinema, and I want to sort of tap into that. And, you know, to help me achieve that, uh, I was, you know, so lucky uh, to, to work with a, a, a team of guys in L.A. called Mark Monroe and Paul Crowder. And, and uh, Paul Crowder cut films um, like, like Ron's uh, Beatles documentary mm -hmm. and the new Pavarotti film, which is a masterpiece. And uh, he made a film called Dogtown and Z-Boys that I saw when I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And just the way the film moved just the way it, 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 it went down that river. It was so phenomenal. And, and you know, Paul thought, taught me a thing or two. And, uh, I, you know, I was incredibly grateful to have that mentorship from a, a legend. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, let's go back to our legends here for a second. <laughs> because I, you mentioned uh, Beatles eight days a week. 
Um, and I'm really interested in, in what sort of the creative uh, opportunities or maybe even tension there is when you set about to make a documentary about a living person or someone whose family is still there. I mean, I understand you had conversations with Paul McCartney even when you were making that. How does that relate to this film? Well, that was interesting in, in, in as much as, as um, uh, you know, I, I was allowed to have the final cut that I normally have when I'm directing. Uh, and, he, and he said, uh, so I know I don't have any control over this, but the one thing that I would just suggest and is that looking at this time frame of just the touring years, and when I look at some of the pictures, um, John and I were really friends. We really loved each other. There's a lot that happened afterwards that scarred us both, and I still feel it today. But I recognize that when you're talking about this time period, that was that was a that was a difference, and it's sort of it's sort of been forgotten, even by me a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a chance. So I thought that was just an interesting insight. Um, I think that you know we've done so many projects about you know scripted uh, projects, and often the people were were still alive. Mm -hmm. And and I think that at the end of the day that you know, your obligation is to the story and the audience, sure, but you do know you're gonna have to look this individual in the eye <laughs> at some point. <laughs> and if you've, if you've synthesized, if you've made a kind of a shortcut in, in any way, you have to be able to really explain that you, you made it with integrity to support the narrative and some other truth. Mm -hmm. And so I think whether it's scripted or uh, you know, or, or whether, it's, whether it's a straight documentary, you always you you always want to be able to look yourself in the mirror, and you certainly want to be able to look your subject in the mirror or their or their survivors, right. and you know, and feel that that you you got at the truth, mm -hmm. but you still had to make something that was compelling, entertaining, and of course, you, it, it's editorial. I mean, I don't care if it's a if it's a piece of journalism or a, a scripted piece or a documentary. Of course, it's an opinion. It's a point of view. It's an expression. You know, uh, who knows what the truth, you know, right. is? It's your, your, your it's your truth. sense of it, mm -hmm. and that's what you, and that's what you're uh, sharing. But I have a question for you, actually, if you don't mind. I don't want uh, yes, to take over. Yes, please. The, well, <laughs> and because on this I had distance. I had some, you know, it was an exciting opportunity. It came our way. We were th just thrilled. It was fascinating. Everything about it was go go go. Yes yes yes. And then during the process, so I started observing various cuts and things like that. And you did a second interview. You had done one, and then you did another one. And it kind of blew all of us away, and what it kind of added to the film and then the way you worked with it, uh, with Paul and, their, and company. And I then remembered that for, we had actually done second interviews with both Ringo and with Paul. And, and at that time, we were just, they were supposed to be just short interviews to try to fill in some gaps, but the, for some reason, they were much more open and fluid. And, 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 and those interviews went on, and they wound up really transforming that film in a way that surprised us. So I kind of wanted to ask you both about what it is to come in and talk about your life once and then think about it and then come back and talk about it again and what it meant to the movie. Yeah, a big part of that decision um, <clears throat> was helped by Justin Wilkes and Sarah Bernstein. They were encouraging us. They wanted, <clears throat> for all the work that we had done on the film, they wanted to raise the bar. And we wanted to raise the bar. So then it was really, it was really about, at that period, after White Pine Pictures, and you know, and Bell Media, and all of the wonderful people that, were, that had, you know supported this, and we were getting it off the ground. And then Justin and I, we we had been talking about again doing something together for a long time. And then when they came, when Justin said, "Imagine Entertainment is going to come in on, to this," and we we really want to just make this as good as it could be. And that was part of the process of just making a film and saying, all right, let's, let's up the ante here. Mm -hmm. And we were thrilled about the idea that there was this kind of encouragement, this kind of opportunity, and all of that. So we've been very lucky in this process to be working 
with all of you guys that have been just amazingly supportive in putting this together. So each level, each person, each the ideas, the encouragement, all of that stuff is added up to what we're going to premiere tonight at the Toronto International Film Festival. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah, amazingly cool. And thank you, yeah. Justin and Sarah, too, yeah. for you know putting us together. And I hear there's, I mean, so literally with the partners, I mean, it was like this synergistic, uh, it's just wonderful that, you know, the universal music with the music and Imagine yeah. Entertainment and Crave and Bell Media and, and of course all the uh, tax credits and the envelopes because of how Canada supports its, uh, its film industry. Um, but I understand there's an announcement that's going to be made in terms of distribution outside of Canada. Brian, do you know something about that? <laughs> a little company called Magnolia. Oh, wait, Ron. Oh, my, here's the microphone. Magnolia is going to distribute the movie theatrically around the world. We're very excited for this collaboration and partnership. And we're announcing awesome. that today. Awesome. And I'll just, what, just, so just on that, because it's sort of a, an industry uh, question, and then I'm going to throw it over to, over to the audience. Do you, given that there are so many ways that Canadian um, artists and talent are supported here in the country, and it's, it's kind of necessary because we're the mouse living next to the elephant with the big, all of this creative, creative content coming over the border. It, do you have a view on how Canada supports its film industry? Well, I do, yeah. I mean, I have a, I have a view on, on, on sort of any country culture that supports its artists. Um, and and you, 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 know, you look to Europe and you sort of see the countries who, that have begun not supporting their, their arts, as they once did, and the ones who have continued that support, for example, Scandinavian countries or France, they do it, they care about it, Canada does it, and, uh, and, and uh, to, 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 to a degree the UK does it, Ireland, they do it, but Germany, Italy, you know, it's, it's, it's disappointing to work with these, these artists and know what the struggle that they're going through uh, to try to to preserve their kind of their cultural identity, their aesthetic identity, and so I'm, you know, I think it's vitally important. I mean, I mean the thing that I'd say, and I've made more than two movies here and done some television. I mean, and it's and it's something that you guys might even just take for granted, the, the Canadians here, but it, um, you're good people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the the thing is, is it's a, kind of a central. It's an element that is slight, somewhat of a central difference between. Uh, America and I'm just dangerous in Canada, but similar work ethics, similar similar skill sets, but humility uh, humility as an element to a team is really really important. It can't be uh, it can't be understated. It's just when you because making a movie or documentary whatever it is, it's teams of hundreds of people, often more, and. You, you're getting people, you have to evangelize your reason for existing. Um, in the case of Robbie, since we're here for Robbie and, and the band movie, it's just like, it's a worthy subject. You have to start with a worthy subject. And then if you can make that case that it's a worthy subject, you can evangelize something that's amorphous and get hundreds of people to put their lives in, you know, aside and move it to the other, and move to make a movie or television show, in this case, Robbie's, and, and, um, and you, when you have a team that's humble and has the same level of work ethic and desire to win, it, it just works better. So you'll be doing more here in Canada then. Thank you. Very good. Okay, yes. Sir. Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Juan Carlos Garcia from Mexico. This question is for you, Mr. Robertson. Uh, nowadays, we are living in the music industry, this kind of uh, new distribution uh, music style with the uh, reproduction on platforms, uh, the likes on social networks. What do you think of that in which do you consider is the main difference in the music industry between the time when you started and the time that the music is living nowadays? You know, I think that there is always great work being done. I, I, I never lose faith that there will be people coming along making a great contribution. And music, there's a lot of stuff today that I, I just love. And 
there, the biggest difference, though, for me between then and now, then the music that I was involved with, that I made, that I did with Bob Dylan, that I did with the band, we were in a generation that the music was the voice of that generation. Everybody, you know, gathered around that voice. And so you felt a responsibility to talk about something, to tell a story about something that had a deeper meaning to it. And nowadays, um, they don't have that kind of pressure to have to do something like that. But we were, you know, there was, our leaders were being assassinated. There was this terrible war going on. So this unification in that generation had a lot to do with the soundtrack of it. And now, people, like I said, don't have that pressure to do that. And so it calls on a different thing in the culture to me. It's called, have a good time. And it's also called, tell us about your last b relationship and, and the breakup. You know, that's what so many records are, are made about today. And, you know, and sometimes you think, like what I'm saying, well, that's a worthy cause. Me, I don't care about your last relationship, really, honestly. <laughs> but, but go ahead and vent. It's OK. <laughs> not songs that matter then, no. And it's not like there isn't anything to write about out there. Yes, ma'am. Hello, everyone. Andrea Case, CTV News Toronto. Uh, for the two Torontonians on the stage in particular. What is it like to bring this film to Toronto? I know you've probably been working on it to the very last minute, Daniel. But what is it like to bring it to Toronto? And why did you want to bring it here? And how does it feel to be back? Robbie, starting. Well, th this is just talk about a celebration of a project. And to have made this film, and we started out in a very modest way, you know, with White Pine. We were just saying, you know what, we want to do something really nice, really good. It's inspired by your book, and we really enjoyed the book. It's a Canadian thing, you know, all of that stuff. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and now we're here tonight. I mean, I can't imagine a bigger compliment than opening the Toronto International Film Festival, you know, with a young Torontonian director here and this kind of team. It doesn't get better. Great. And, and then from my point of view, you know, I obviously grew up in the city and, and TIFF is the, uh, the biggest event in Canadian cinema, one of the biggest events in global cinema. Um, and so I've been saying this a lot, but this idea that's like, you know, I've been telling people this is a dream come true. This is a dream come true. But when I really thought about it, it's like, well, no, actually, I never dreamed this was possible. I never <laughs> dreamed that my documentary would open TIFF. A Canadian documentary has never opened TIFF before. Um, and when I, when I sort of reach that perspective, you know, it's just this idea that, that Robbie's life really speaks to, which is like anything is possible. Robbie sort of grew up as he, a self-described dead-end kid, um, and he just envisioned this life for himself, and, and, and you know, you can do anything, and, and that's what I'm thinking about, and that's what I'm feeling a lot of gratitude towards um, as I sit on this stage with these extraordinary men. Question behind. Hi, Jens Peterson from Aftonbladet, Sweden. Uh, in the film, we learned that you wanted to work with Bergman. So what did Ingmar Bergman's films mean to you? I, w I, I, w I went through a period um, I, I, a lot of inspiration for a lot of songs that I wrote came from s movie scripts. There was a bookstore on 47th Street in New York where I used to go and I found out that I could buy the script for Persona, for The Seventh Seal, for Eight and a Half, for Boone Wellfields, for Kurosawa movies, for Howard Hawks, for Orson Welles, for John Ford. And it was so wonderful to be able to go behind that mystery of seeing a movie and saying, whoa, how did they do that? I needed to go deeper. I needed to know more. And I got really addicted to reading those scripts. And I went through a period where 
when a new Bergman film came out, I was like first in line. I, I just couldn't get enough of it. And then actually in the band, I thought of this group as a cast of characters that I was casting in roles in the songs that I was writing. I would say, you should sing this because of the story that I'm trying to tell. You should, you sh you're going to be the lead in this one. You're going to sing the harmony, and then you're going to come in on the chorus and take it all the way up. So it was in inspired by that in a very strange way, and I don't know any other group or I don't know any other songwriter really that comes from this kind of background. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's no wonder that Robbie's sixth solo album, which is coming out in a couple of weeks, is called Cinematic. Because uh, this relationship with movies and creatives and songwriting has there, it's, you're busy at the moment, right? You've got the 50th anniversary uh, reissue coming out of the band. You're writing the sequel to Testimony. You've got this film. You've got um, your music. You just scored Scorsese's new film, The Irishman. Do, do you wake up in the morning with an idea and think, ooh, that's a film score? No, it's a song. Oh, maybe I should draw it. <laughs> because there's 14, this, all the songs on the new record have a, a piece of art that Robbie's done. So do, do they call to you in terms of how these ideas want to be handled? Or I don't know. This all just makes me feel lazy. <laughs> <laughs> You're hardly lazy. This that's is, a big list. This <laughs> is... This is all part of this gumbo that I, I'm just in the middle of. And I, and I started doing this when I was 16 years old. And I still feel very much that same heartbeat mm -hmm. of just like I was saying earlier. You get up and you say, OK, oh my god, this is going to be. I'm so looking forward to this. And I don't know if I can do it. You know what I mean? It's so different. It's such a challenge. Where do we begin? We got a blank canvas here. Oh, my God. And then it's, it's just exciting to be able to do the creative process. It's just one of the most exciting, sometimes scary, yeah. but wondrous things to be able to do. So I just can't stop these. And I've never exposed before the art that I do. And in this case, the songs, I could see them. They were like, again, little movies, which I've been writing songs like that for a long time. But then these images started coming forward. And I thought, I'm going to share this now for the first time. So yeah, here awesome. we go. There you go. So I guess Ronnie was right when he met you at 15, when he said, I think this kid's got a lot of potential. Is what he said. One last question. Yes, sir. In the front row. Thank you. Um, for Robbie, um, in terms of your motivation and willingness to go ahead with this film, were there any um, sort of facts that you wanted to set straight or sort of widely held fan opinions that you wanted to address or clarify? What were your main motivations? I don't know if we were. From, from my point of view, I didn't know whether we, we needed to set anything straight. But I think Daniel, you know, him just coming into this story because he was the one that said, I, you know, they asked him what he wanted to do next. And he said, well, I'd like to make a documentary on Robbie's book. And I think from his reading of this book, what he was left with, I think he had some questions. And, and he did address this in, the, in this film. And I come, I'm, uh, I'm on the inside, so I don't, I don't think about that too much. I'm really thinking about the next song that I have to write for cinematic. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was his job to say, you know, let's bring this to the surface. This, this is important. And, you know, so anyway, you know, I, I would pass the baton to, to Daniel on that. Anything you felt you really wanted to set the record straight about? Well, I, I think I know what you're speaking to, uh, of course. And uh, ultimately, my motivation here in, in making this film is because I'm incredibly passionate, not just about Robbie and his work, but about the band. And, and one thing that I always felt is, um, uh, y you know, part of the, the legacy of the band, a lot of the oxygen in, in, in that room was absorbed by this, this 
you know, apparent feud that I had read about that I didn't know much about. And, and you know, what I came to realize when I was making the film is that that's not something that we need to, that we're going to remember in 100 years. That's not something, you know, when I'm playing the music or talking about the band with my grandkids, this feud, whatever that's about, is not something that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the music. And so I really just put emphasis on the brotherhood and what these guys did together and this extraordinary creative collaboration. And that's what I'm really excited about to share with the film. It's not much different than what you were saying, Ron, about Paul McCartney saying to you, one thing that I do want to share with you is that John and I were like what we're talking about. We're like brothers. And it's true. And Levon and I, I loved Levon. And we were not like brothers. To me, we were brothers. And we went through the war together. And we did so many amazing things in our life together. And then years later, I, I wasn't there. But it, for him, it went to another place. And I had no control over that. So I just stepped aside. And, you know, people, you know, they, they go over, they're going to go, you know. And it, nothing changed in my heart. So yeah. I've, I, I just got to take care of what's on my side of the street. Um, we have run out of time, um, but we do, I see Mayor John Tory sitting there in uh, w a very interesting footgear, um, and I think uh, you have something to say, John, why don't you please, uh, can you get to the stage or should we come to you? Oh, you're going to come down here, okay. Um, am I under arrest? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Actually, when I go to Los Angeles to promote the film industry, I started giving out my business cards and saying it was a get out of jail free card, but then I realized I actually can't get anybody out of jail. But I did tell any of those people who might get into that situation I would come and visit them if they called the phone number on that card. May I, uh, first of all, say good afternoon to everybody and, and especially good afternoon uh, to you. And it was so interesting for me to sit and listen to uh, to you talk this afternoon and all of the people that helped make this uh, movie. Um, I have the honor of being able to present uh, the key to the city to people and we've tried to uh, confine it to people who uh, embody the spirit and the potential of our great city, uh, who inspire others in the city and who have contributed significantly to the civic life of the city, whether they're here doing it or whether they've done it from uh, somewhere else. And in your case, um, there is no question but that you're um, your credentials in that regard are uh, beyond any that, uh, that have ever been, uh, li have ever li lay behind uh, the presentation of this before. Um, I believe, um, and, and this is something that I believe as a person and, and as the mayor, that uh, artists, uh, and in particular I've tried to really throw my uh, weight behind uh, music and film, and, and, but all forms of the arts, I think they not only allow us to expose the soul uh, of the city and to tell stories, which as you know we were talking about this a little bit on the phone today, um, telling Canadian stories is sometimes challenging in light of the fact that we are the uh, mouse living next uh, to the elephant and uh, you have uh, contributed immensely to our ability to do that. Um, and as well, um, we are, as you know, the most diverse city in the world and it's a point of great pride for us. We've been enriched by people coming here and we continue to be enriched by that as other countries and cities are turning their backs on people coming from somewhere else. We say, send them here. Uh, because they're going to be people who are going to continue to enrich our city. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that can often unify people who can't speak to each other in the same language is music or art or film or dance because they can stand next to each other and enjoy a performance mm -hmm. and, and, and celebrate that together even if they can't speak. And so what I've chosen to do in, the, in having the privilege of presenting these keys to the city is to choose some of the people that have been pioneers. Uh, and people who have really set an example have perhaps done it, as we were discussing today, at a time when it was more of a struggle to do it. It's still a struggle uh, to, to achieve a global preeminence as an artist uh, from a, a, a smaller country like Canada, but uh, you did that at a time when I think it was even tougher uh, than it is today. 
Um, so if you look, I mean, you, at, at what else qualifies you from the standpoint of your connection to Toronto, you worked at the CNE. This is proof positive. For those, who are, for those who are from out of town, it's the Canadian National Exhibition. You'd have to see it to understand what it is. He worked there, and that by itself, just by itself, qualifies you as a very genuine uh, Torontonian. Um, you embraced music from early on, as we were hearing discussed. From 15 years of age, people were recording uh, your songs. Uh, from modest beginnings uh, in our city, uh, and we've heard a bit about that, and I'm sure when I see the film tonight, we're going to see more of that. Uh, you've achieved global, iconic uh, status uh, as a musician and as somebody very interested in the film uh, industry as well. And you have touched so many people with your music, and, and, and what the real test is, I think, is that uh, I'm of an age where I sort of, you know, remember well growing up, um, you know, with, with your music, but my children and my grandchildren will also grow up. Uh, with your music. It stands the test of time, as we were hearing discussed uh, earlier on. So uh, it is just something that we, um, we wanted to, to do in addition to the music, which is uh, the movie, rather, which I suppose is the ultimate uh, tribute that somebody can pay to consider your life worthy of uh, making a movie about. And it's not finished yet. I'm sure there'll be a sequel. But having said that, um, we just wanted to uh, honor the fact that you have um, have, have that passion that you have for music and for film and for artistry and for all the things that were being discussed up here and the inspiration that it has provided for so many other people, including, I hope, uh, artists, musicians, uh, and other people who live in this city today who are wondering you know, uh, about, about dreams that do or do not come true, maybe not even having the dreams because they think it's not practical. And you have stood as an example to those people and to many others uh, to explore your talent, not to be afraid to produce something, whether it's music or a film or a piece of art that leads the way, uh, to be determined to succeed and to be whatever you want to be, and to never tell, stop telling your own story. And so, if I can just find it here, I'm sure it's somewhere behind me here, we actually do have, and I, I was discussing with you today, we've never quite figured out what the key opens. Um, we haven't figured that out, but you may figure that out, and I want to just open it here so that we can not only see it, show it to you, but... Oh, now, if I take this to the uh, Toronto Bank, and, and make a, myth, a withdrawal. Uh, then I will have to come and visit you in jail. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you, I got the you can take my card in your pocket and call me and say, I've tried to open the bank with the key and it didn't work out so well. Would you please come and visit me? And I will. Uh, and I'll bring food. Well, this one's quite beautiful, guys. You know? And check, I'll stand out here so we can, take, we can hold it, hold it up. Oh, there we are. So I can wow. that to you. There, there we are. Yeah. And so it comes with... Uh, with great effect, affection and respect uh, oh. from the people of the City of Toronto on whose behalf I stand here uh, today to uh, honor you as uh, one of our great mm -hmm. Torontonians. I'm really touched by this, it, you know, and it's a complete surprise to me. So thank you very, very m much from the bottom of my heart. This is, this is my hood and now I got the key. And that, that goes with it. I won't read the inscription that's on it, but it really says a lot of what the movie says and what I've tried to say uh, inadequately today, but thank oh, you for Mayor, everything you've done you, for us. Thank you Thanks so much. I really appreciate well it. Well done. All right. Uh, thank you, Mayor Tory. And uh, just on your behalf, may I say, I know you've always been a champion of the arts in this city, and uh, please keep that up. Um, that's a wrap, everybody. Our, uh, our illustrious guests have places to go and things to do. You have to go write reviews. And uh, thank you all for coming and continued su success to everyone here. And enjoy the festival. Thank you. Thanks.